Rushwood Center at Ryerson Woods presents the 37th Annual Smith Nature Symposium. Rushwood Center is located in the Ryerson Woods Forest Preserve in Riverwoods, Illinois, and honors this land as the traditional home of the Council of Three Fires. Today, Brushwood Center continues to be a place where many people from diverse backgrounds find healing, vitality, and relationship with nature. You can learn more and support this work at brushwoodcenter.org. Now is the time to create a more resilient tomorrow. This year, the Smith Nature Symposium Series explores what it will take to build a more just and sustainable future in the aftermath of COVID-19. Welcome to the 37th Annual Smith Nature Symposium. Welcome to Brushwood Center's Smith Nature Symposium Lecture, featuring global advocates for the ocean, artist Erica Hilton, and biochemist Dr. Janet Angel Welsh who will explore the beauty of water and the danger of pollutants. My name is Gail Sturm and I serve as chairman of the board of Brushwood Center at Ryerson Woods. This panel is the second of a seven part live stream series exploring current environmental issues and Erica and Janet will dive into the threats facing the world's oceans and water sources and what we can do to make a difference. Luminaries Robert Redford and Sibylla Shigars Redford were the recipients of Brushwood Center's Environmental Leadership Award in 2018. They continue to dedicate themselves to protecting our planet, and we are honored to open this session with a special video musical performance, Reflections on Earth Oceans, created by Sibylla Shigars Redford, the artistic director of the way of the rain with music by Tim Janis and the spoken word by Robert Redford. Sibylla states, nature is my spiritual connection to life, the land and the world. And nature is my guide and inspiration in creating art. As artists and through art, we have the power to open minds and bring awareness to our planet's beauty and fragility. As collaborators, we unite to strengthen our voices and like raindrops, together we nourish the river of life. Oceans. More than 70% of our planet is covered by oceans, lakes, and rivers. These massive liquid bodies of water are among Earth's most valuable natural resources to sustain life on our planet for all creatures that live here. Oceans, for example, govern the weather and the air we breathe, regulate temperature, and are home to most life on Earth. From microscopic algae to the largest animal on the planet, the blue whale.
This work beautifully encapsulates what's at stake with numerous threats to our oceans and waterways and why today's conversation is so critical. I wanna take a moment to introduce Erica and Janet who take very different approaches to preserving the world of water, but share the same ambition for restoring it and work to inspire people to be better stewards of this precious resource. Erica Hilton is a Mediterranean born artist who uses fine art to capture the beauty and vulnerability of the watery world. She is now based in Chicago, where she is the director of Hilton Amas Contemporary, a gallery platform that she leverages to support art artists and environmentalists who seek change for a better planet. Erica believes moving people to the plight of the oceans is something art is uniquely equipped to do and actually incorporates microplastics into her pieces to call attention to plastic pollution in our waterways. Dr. Janet Angel is a passionate preservationist with over 25 years in research and development, is a biochemical scientist, wellness expert, CEO, entrepreneur, inventor, and speaker. Her revolutionary green technology, EcoBioClean, rapidly removes oil contaminants from the environment. EcoBioClean was nominated for the prestigious 2018 United States Presidential Green Chemistry Challenge Award and is listed on the National Contingency Plan as an effective and safe method to remediate crude oil spills. Janet was inspired to develop EcoBioClean after the 2010 Deep Water Horizon oil spill, which emptied 4 million barrels of oil into the Gulf of Mexico. Erica, you and I met not long ago when your stunning artwork drew me into a crowded gallery in Aspen, Colorado, and I quickly recognized your dedication to advocating for nature through the beauty of art. Your stunning series, I Flow Like Water, was born out of a scientific expedition to Raja Ampat, Indonesia, that you were invited to participate in by Ocean's Geographic magazine. Please tell us about this adventure and more broadly, what drew you to focus your life's work on advocating for our oceans? Thank you so much, Gail. It is such an honor to be here with you and Hi, Gail. Janet. Hi, Gail. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's my little arrow. <laughs> he wanted to be part of this. So um, what drew me to Raja Ampad and what drew me to work with, with um, plastics and the oceans? I think it stems from wanting to know where I came from. I was born, like you said, on the Mediterranean. I came to America when I was six years old. Didn't speak a word of English. And uh, my, my parents put me in school. It took about six months before I was able to speak. And um, it, it, it was this experience of being born in another country, being raised in another country, and not feeling rooted. And I wanted to understand what it is, what it, where my roots are. And the more I learned about science, I learned about evolution and humanity and um, through the arts, actually, I, I realized that we are all interconnected from the stars to the earth. I mean, we are all, all the elements in our bloodstream are the same elements that are in a star. And the oceans, the earth, everything on our earth is interconnected, human beings to nature, to trees, to water. And like um, the beautiful video that you just, the film that you just showed by uh, Robert Redford and his wife, Sibylla Shagars Redford, um, it, it touched me because we are 70% water. The earth is 70% water. And I talk about that in my own film. 
And without water, we wouldn't exist. And so what we're doing right now is we are using these single use plastics that we're going to be talking about um, that we use time and we throw away. And where does it go? It goes into landfills. It goes into eventually into rivers and the ocean. And so my expedition, I was asked to be the artist on board, um, the scientific expedition to Raja Ampat, Indonesia by Ocean Geographic Magazine. And it was one of the great honors for me. I, I was with National Geographic photographers. Um, I was invited to be the artist and to record what we had seen. We were trawling for plastics in one of the, the most biodiverse areas in the world. Raja Ahmad has more species of fish and corals than anywhere on the planet. Now, it's a protected area, but still the Indonesian government is constantly trying to make sure that the oceans aren't being, or the, the waters there are not being overfished. Um, the sharks and the mantas are not being um, killed for their fins or for their meat. Um, there's so many different things, and we found microplastics in a place where they shouldn't exist. This should mm -hmm. be paradise on earth, and that's what we found. And so mm -hmm. that's how it all came about. Yeah. Well, thank you. You've been so kind um, to share some footage with us, so let's take a look. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Seventy percent of the earth is water. Seventy percent of our bodies is water. And guess what? Seventy percent of the oxygen that we breathe comes from water. It comes from these tiny little ocean plants called phytoplankton that live near the water's surface and they drift with the currents. And like all plants, they photosynthesize, which means that they use sunlight and carbon dioxide to make food. And the byproduct of that photosynthesis is the oxygen that we breathe. So I've been doing a series um, for the last few years called I Flow Like Water. This series is about the importance of water in our lives. And I've been working with recycled plastics and I've been infusing them into my oil and acrylic paintings. And so today I'm actually going to be flowing like water. See what it's like to paint underwater and basically be water. Extraordinary. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. You know, many people think of climate change as a rise in temperatures thanks to the increasing concentrations of carbon and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. But what's less obvious is how the rise in temperatures has a major effect on our water. Erica, what does the ocean have to do with regulating climate and why are the Arctic and Antarctica important focuses for us to care about. Oh, <laughs> how, many, how many years do you have to talk about this? <laughs> so the oceans are the regulators of our climate. When you think about it, um, if, okay, so we have the rain and the clouds and the oceans and, and the temperatures. As temperatures rise, the, the ice, uh, the, the ice is, is melting, whether it's the polar, on um, both polar ice caps, sorry about that, both, both the Antarctic and the Arctic are melting now. And so as the climate changes, now we have more hurricanes, we have tornadoes, we have tsunamis, we have drastic weather patterns that are happening all over the world. We have earthquakes, we have volcanoes. I mean, there is nothing one single thing that is not affected by climate change. And that's something that we have to consider on how we are living our lives to live consciously, sustainably, and it has to do with water because without water, we wouldn't exist. Yeah. And so the oceans are 
the regulators as far as everything on our earth. Everything. I mean, there isn't one single thing that it doesn't uh, uh, affect. You know, you've spoken of single-use plastics. Could you define exactly what are single-use plastics and what is their impact on our environment? I know this is a very, very um, important topic for you to discuss. So single-use plastics, every single day we use plastics that we use one time and throw away, whether it's straws, whether it's the, the carry-out containers, plastic water bottles, um, what plastic um, cups for, or even the styrofoam cups for coffee. We go into a restaurant, a cafe. We have something that we use one time and we throw it away. That's a single-use plastic. Okay, plastic are not necessarily bad if they're being used for an item, you know, like computers or keyboards or or manufacturing in some sort. Um, right now, they're using recycled plastics to make roads in some countries. I wish we were doing that in America. Um, but those can be replaced. We don't have to use straws. Why do we need straws? Um, we could drink the old-fashioned way. Well, so we can take our own bottles and have the coffee poured into our own containers. We don't need the styrofoam. Styrofoam mm -hmm. can't even be recycled. And when we say the word recycled, there's very little today that's being recycled. Mm -hmm. What's happening, is, oh, please go ahead. No, no, I think you raise a very important issue and it's a call to action for all of us to be vigilant about, you know, um, reorganizing our habits. So thank you so much, you know, for um, bringing that to everybody's attention. And together um, we can make a big difference. So that's a very simple um, immediate request that I think we all can act upon. What do you believe the short and long-term impact of the health of our oceans is including the fish and the mammals and how does it affect human health and the preservation of humanity? It's a big question. It's a big question. It's a scientists from around the world have been trying to answer. Um, the statistics say that within 30 years, the large fish in the ocean are going to be gone from overfishing, illegal fishing, um, the tunas, the large sharks, um, over 100 million sharks a year are caught just for their fins. They, they catch them, they cut off their fins, and they throw them back into the ocean to basically drown because without their fins, they can't, they can't move. Um, it's a horrifying death. And sharks are important to the ecosystem of the oceans and the, the large picture of all the fish. Um, the whales, the, 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 the governments who are doing experiments with sound, sonar, um, they're destroying the, the health of the large fish in the ocean, the small fish in the ocean, everything. Um, tunas are being overfished and they're being kept in freezers because the fishermen know that this is not going to last. And so now they have fish farms and, and the health of those fish farms, not all of them are healthy. You have to be very careful and check on which fish you eat that are sustainably caught, that are wild caught, that, are, that aren't full of mercury, that aren't full of, of toxics, um, toxic um, pollutants. And the one thing that people don't realize is that when we eat fish, the fish are eating microplastics. The plankton is eating microplastics. You know, you've heard about the large whale that had, I don't know how many pounds of plastics in their system. This is every single fish today. And we don't realize the sea salt. We don't know when we're eating sea salt if there's plastic in there because mm -hmm. it's everywhere. It's become ubiquitous. It's in everything that we eat. So when you ask about the health of humanity, yeah, we're not healthy. We are not healthy because we're eating the plastic that we throw away. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, companies, restaurants, um, 
everyone should think about using compostable, biodegradable products. They're not that much more expensive. I mean, we had a cafe next door to my gallery. We talked about it. And the owner of the gallery said, oh, no, 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 I can't. My, my, my customers will be so upset if I don't offer them plastic straws because the paper straws don't last. Okay, drink faster, use a spoon, do something. But you don't need to use plastic straws. I think, what is it, 500 million straws a day are used one time and thrown away. Yeah. It's Thank you so much so... waste. And it's not about money. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, I become Thank so you. passionate. You about do. It. And and you are one of our strongest advocates. And it's voices like yours that are going to make a difference and get people to recognize how important their single action um, is and, and what it can mean. It's literally in, in some cases a matter of life and death. So thank you. Janet. We go way back, and I clearly recall the extraordinary story surrounding your invention. What life events led up to you literally jumping into the Gulf? Well, first of all, thank you, and Erica, for your contribution to supporting the health of the ocean. And aliens, we absolutely go way back. And for about <laughs> years, you know that I spent a, a good deal of time in hospitals and private practice in body chemistry. And because of that work, I was also formulating. And in 2010, um, just after the Deepwater Horizon disaster, I got a phone call from an attorney who lived down in Florida that was working with me on another invention for the medical community. And he said, you know, Janet, you've come up with some really crazy ideas and really inventions. <laughs> So do you have any ideas of how you can clean up the oil spill down in uh, the Gulf? And I thought, oh gosh, I want to say no, not at all. I'm not, bio, I'm not a biochemist, not a chemist. I certainly am not a marine biologist, nor do I know much at all about crude oil or the ocean. But my father's words kind of rang in my mind. He was an inventor. So I said, you know what? Let me think about this. My theory was, Gail, that I wondered if the ocean was akin in any way to the human body and would it react if I gave it what it needed to do its job? But I didn't know how that would be possible unless I got a sample of oil from that spill. And we got samples from oil around the globe and tested my product on those and it worked great. But I needed that specific oil sample in order to know if I'd be successful. And because I was unable to obtain one by mail, I thought that's not going to stop me. I'm just going to and get one myself. <laughs> well, it nearly cost me my life. When we re reached Grand Isle, um, off the coast where the oil spill had occurred, the fumes were just killer. They were just so noxious. The yeah, 16 miles of oceanfront were cordoned off. They were by fencing, and you could not get anywhere near the oceanfront. I even asked the coast guard, I just want to go down and get a little sample, and I'll be out in a minute. And he's like, he's the end. No one did that. <laughs> and I thought, okay, well, that didn't stop me either. As a scientist, you want to know if something's going to work, if it's going to be helpful. And so um, we met, made many phone calls, as Gail, you know the story, and we finally were able to find a gentleman who was a 35-year veteran from the oil rig, Conoco, and he also owned a good bit of the island. He took us out the next morning at 5 a.m. on his speedboat, behind the scenes to a mile off of, to an area called Baratari, where they were cleaning up the birds and fish, and you know, it was just very sad to see what was going on. In any case, we had to get off the boat about 80 yards from shore. All of my equipment was plastic, so we, um, the team and I, we went down and, and we swam from the boat to the shore, to do some testing, which was successful, but I saw fresh oil, you know, off to the rocks about 60 yards away, I thought, well, I'll just wait here. I'm just going to wait over and uh, get a test sample, and I'll be right back. We had only 30 minutes in and out. Well, I was very surprised when about 30 yards out, I sank up to my chest in black oil crystals. I nearly didn't make it out. And everything you've heard about your life flashing before you when you think you're going to lose your life is true. I won't go through how I got out, but I'm here today to tell the story that um, my product worked better than we ever imagined. Um, 
the oil and also the uh, chemicals that were part of you know, the dispersing action. So yes, um, I can say that we had an extraordinary trip. There's so much more that I could tell you, but I can't. <laughs> you know, Gail, you I absolutely do. remember it. I do, and I have to say, um, the way you got out was nothing short of a miracle. And you you drew upon your own knowledge um, at a point when most people would panic to a degree that would not allow them to come up with a solution. But that's what makes you such a brilliant scientist. You're always coming up with solutions to what people consider to be the impossible. You know, you and I've spent many hours talking about complementary medicine and your devotion to energy healing. How has this method influenced your technology today? Well, it's a great question and it absolutely has influenced the way I think about life because I always look for the root cause of any imbalance. And I want to support other methods, other systems that will um, elicit healing. And so I completely use that same complementary approach in uh, devising eco-bioclean technology. And so when we, when we look at the ocean, it was definitely uh, ailing. It needed emergency room care. And I looked at how did the ocean attempt to heal itself? And when I discovered what those actions were, I comprised elements that would support those activities. And it, it worked just beautifully, Gail. Well, let's take a look because it is absolutely miraculous. Uh, Janix supplied us with a clip. So here we go. Okay, today is July 25th, 2019, and we're doing a, a test with EcoBioClean 100 COSW and Peruvian crude oil in warm salt ocean water. The dilution we're using with EcoBioClean is one to 10. We're going to spray it on. You can see how quickly it disperses. It continues working to biodegrade. It's no wonder you're being sought after by governments around the world. And um, we just can't thank you enough, truly, Janet. You know, today, one in three people live without safe drinking water. By 2050, up to 5.7 billion people could be living in areas where water is scarce for at least one month a year. Janet, how much of the world's drinking water is drinkable? Astoundingly, just two and a half percent of the world's water is drinkable, but there's only one percent that is accessible. The rest is locked in ice caps and snow fields. So we really, really must preserve our precious water supply. Climate resilient water supply and sanitation can save over 360,000 infants annually. How many people die each year due to a lack of safe water, Janet? Well, according to the Centers for Disease Control and the World Health Organization, nearly 3 million people annually die from poisoned water and not having pure enough water to drink, bathe in, and cook. It's just really shameful. And that needs to stop. By 2040, global energy demand is projected to increase by 25% and water demand is expected to increase by 50%. Thinking about those projections, two questions, Janet. Is fresh water replaceable? And could EcoBioClean be useful in cleaning contaminants from fresh water? Well, sadly, there is no replacement for fresh water. Science has not devised any method to replace water on Earth. So again, we must preserve this natural resource. 
And as far as eco bioclean being effective on freshwater, it absolutely is as effective in freshwater environments as it has been in saltwater environments. And uh, regarding that, specific, uh, that specifically, we are involved in a Canadian research project right now, a three-year project, we're in the second year, and we're doing uh, quite well. Our testing is going on nicely, and we're very honored to be a part of that project. Oh, thank you. Um, both Janet and Erica, I'd love to have your viewpoints on this. How can we preserve the marine world and invoke others to take responsibility for its care? Erica? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Janet. As, as you've mentioned, Erica, there's so much that we can do every day in our daily lives, um, making sustainable choices as often as possible, uh, choose paper and wood, bamboo products, stainless steel, glass, vegetable packaging, over plastics. I'll let you say something and I'll continue. <laughs> so, so in agreement. And first, I just want to say I'm in awe of Janet Angel Welch. <laughs> I'm just in awe of what you do. Seriously, you are the scientist. You are the one coming up with these solutions to clean up the mess that human beings have created. And I think that we have to be careful. We have to live consciously. And like you said, replace plastic with these, these um, biodegradable products like the bamboo, like um, the wood products. And we have to be careful about that too with, with the rainforests and the trees being cut down. I mean, there's always some imprint that human beings make on our planet that isn't so healthy. And so we have to be as careful as we can, still survive, and I think it has a lot to do with economics as well. I don't know what you think, Gail and, and mm -hmm. um, Janet, but I think that what we have to do is educate people. First and foremost, once we educate people and they have the ability to think more about other things besides their survival, I mean, we, we know that such a large percentage of the world um, is, is in poverty. And we have to figure out how we can get them educated to the point that they're self-sustaining. And once they are, they're going to care about their environment. Absolutely. I agree with you. Thank you for your compliments. And I, will, uh, also, I also want to say about you, Erica, that your work is extraordinary. And you're very courageous to do what you're doing and to bring uh, so much enlightenment to the world about the plight of the ocean and, and climate in general. The environment in general so thank you uh, but i also agree with you that we must educate people so they understand the effects they have in their everyday life simple changes can make a grand difference think about what you are putting down your drains what you're allowing to uh, go into the sewer system think simple things every day to make life much cleaner for everyone and teach your children to be um, respectful of our planet it's so very important so, and finally, before we take questions from the audience, what is your hope for the world at this time in history? Each of you, we'd love to uh, hear your thoughts on that question. Sure. My hope right now, it's interesting. We're going through such a, a profound experience throughout the world, not just in one, but every country in the world. We have been um, presented with a problem. A problem is some kind of a virus that's affecting human life. And we've been on lockdowns. So we've been learning how to navigate through this time of illness, wellness, everything, and trying to figure out how we can preserve humanity through this this. of this virus, whatever it is. We really don't know what it is. I don't know. I don't know if the two of you or everyone who's listening, I don't know if we all know where it came from, how it came about, but I think this is a wonderful time for us because now we can learn to find solutions. And I like to think, and I think Gail, you and Janet, we're not about problems. We're about solutions. And we're about figuring to survive in harmony with 
everything else in nature, with the animals, with the fish, with the oceans, with pressure, with water. Um, we are, I guess, we're, we have the most developed brain in um, uh, of all sentient beings, although I don't know, I think uh, octopi and whales and, and uh, dolphins, we don't know how developed their brains are, quite developed. And we don't even know, I, I think what we have to do is we have to figure out a way for us to and and survive in a beautiful way where it's about joy and we're not constantly thinking about what have we done just by existing. And so human beings have an opportunity right now to be their best. And I'm excited about this time to be. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you certainly are adding a lot of beauty um, and awareness to all of us. And um, you do live your life like a, 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 a symphony. Um, I, I can attest to that. So thank you so, thank so you. very much. Janet. I would what? say, I'm sorry. No, I, we'd love to hear from you. <laughs> I would say that my hope is right now that more people in this world will realize that the well-being of this earth lies in everyone's hands, crossing borders and continents, and that it's our responsibility to protect the one home that we all share. I, I, want to say in the face of what we are now experiencing unprecedented times, it's so very important to remember that um, we will be measured by what we leave behind for all the generations that follow. And it is my hope and my wish that we leave behind a legacy of wellness for all that follow us. Well, you have dedicated your life to that, Janet, and have contributed so much. Um, so. Deeply, deeply, thank you. Danny, um, perhaps this is a good time where we can take some questions from our audience. Yes, absolutely. We've gotten several questions. Um, I think a great place to start uh, is with you, Erica, on the topic of plastics. Uh, several people ask about, you know, in light of COVID um, and the way things have changed, our safety measures, our, our cautiousness, what are ways people can um, avoid excess use of single-use plastics right now while still adhering to, you know, CDC guidelines, still trying to be as safe and sanitary as possible? Do you have any suggestions? Well, like I was saying, if you are doing a pickup, um, use your own products, bring your own containers. And always make sure, of course, that you have sanitizing wipes. I mean, that's what we've been doing. And that's one thing I want to um, add is during this time, I think the world has been the cleanest it's ever been, a human beings that we're, and we're constantly cleaning our hands and, and we're wiping everything down. Um, I don't know how good that is because I, heard, I, I understand from scientists do need those germs so that we can build up an immunity. However, um, as far as plastics, just go to wherever you're, wherever you're ordering food from, let's say. Let's just use the restaurant industry. Tell them you, you would like to have something that's biodegradable. You know, we live in um, a gated community, which is lovely, and there is there's a club there with a restaurant. And I went in, um, ordered food, and they had, had given it to me a few months ago. Um, plastic containers. Well, I happened to run into the owners of that restaurant. And I said, come on, guys, you know, can't you just use some nice biodegradable containers? And I told them, about, you know, my story, I said, you know, we need to talk about the oceans and what's happening and the earth. And guess what? Three weeks later, I food and they had these wonderful paper, biodegradable, and they were strong containers. And so we have to speak up. And I think that's the answer, yeah. speak up. Yeah. Contribute their part. Fantastic, thank you, Erica. Um, we had another question here um, uh, from uh, Michael Welch uh, for you, Janet. Um, what differentiates Eco Bio Clean from currently used chemical oil dispersants? 
So ethobioclean, first of all, contains no chemicals and it um, biodegrades by you know, reverse engineering. If you look at what crude oil was originally, it was fossil fuel. And fossil fuel contained animal, vegetable, mineral particles. And ecobioclean transforms the crude oil that's toxic into its original components and then also uh, amplifies that by adding a, a group of consortium of microbes and other elements to support the degradation and return to goodness. May I, may I just um, add, uh, ask a question to Janet? Danny, I know we have many questions, but I have one really important question. Yeah, go for it. What about using EcoBioClean on plastics? Yes. Uh, yes. Since they are petroleum products. That's right. Um, I was asked, asked to participate in a, a program that it has to do with the plastics that are you know, affecting the world in general. And there's no doubt that EcoBioClean uh, can do some good there. Because some of the plastics that are made are impregnated with biodegradable elements in them, uh, it would be much easier. So it takes time, but yes, they can definitely. Wow. It would take quite a lot of money to do a grand scale test, but you know, that can be done. Thank you. We're going to work on, on uh, uh, doing a GoFundMe or whatever, crowdfunding, and we're going yes. to get that money for, for the testing. Yeah. Yes, uh, Amazing. Uh, this next question I'll pose generally to both of you. Um, in light, you know, in light of the uh, extreme instances of racism and police brutality we're seeing lately, we would be remiss not to touch on the impact of um, environmental racism in every facet of, of life and society. Um, one of our friends at Cool Learning Experience asked, how do you feel environmental racism and social injustice connects to the issue of water and water quality? I'll let you guys decide who wants to. Yeah, okay. Tough question. Um, I'm a little stumped by that when you tell you the truth, because we're all connected in so many ways and so responsible for everything that um, I don't like to see things, our stuff regarding any difference in um, race, creed, or anything. So, to me, it's a little bit difficult to try to unweave a woven cloth, if you will, to find that to be effect. Erica, in your time and your travels, have you noticed a difference in the impact of water quality based on the areas you've traveled, you know, the qualities of life, the level of investment, or colonial legacies of those regions? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, you know, you go to certain countries and you are told you cannot drink the have to have bottled water. And, and um, back to your first question about the racial injustice, I was thinking, Janet, as you were, you were um, talking about it, um, I think it all has to do with economics. It all has to do with education, awareness, status of the environment of, that those people are living in. Because the higher financial status that they have, they're, they're, they can um, have a certain way of life. They have the clean water. They have their, their local governments to take care of them. I mean, look at Flint, Michigan. What happened in Flint? Why? It was politicians. And so what we have to do as far as any kind of injustice, whether it's environmental injustice, whether it's animal injustices, what's going on, uh, fact farming, um, everything has to do with politics. And people have to speak up and they have to vote for the people who are to make a difference. And they have to stand up and they have to do what's right in their heart. And how many movies have we seen in Hollywood where they say, you know, it only takes one, one voice, and then there's that ripple effect. Absolutely. I think that's what it is. But yeah, I've, I've, I've had um, a lot of problems with water when I've been traveling, to your second question. And um, it's, it's scary because we do that in fashion 
happens, we get, you know, all different things happen if you don't have, if your body's not um, used to the bacteria. I think as a scientist, um, yeah, you would know better than I would, but if your body's not used to it and you don't have an immunity to it, you get sick. Absolutely. I'll say too, for anyone listening that's curious to learn more about different um, uh, pieces of environmental, uh, how you know, how water quality is an environmental justice issue is a rate, an issue of environmental racism. There's great resources at 350.org run by actually our um, symposium mm -hmm. keynote speaker on October 7th, 2nd, um, Bill McKibben, as well as the website um, Intersectional Environmentalist. They have great resources for learning more about how you can contribute to um, the fight against environmental racism, how you can combat these injustices in the community you live in and the communities around you. Um, Next, uh, Erica, I'll, I'll continue on with uh, a question for you, probably a quick one. Somebody, I'm sure inspired by the video of you, asked if you are a free diver, and if so, <laughs> how long are your dives? Okay, so I am not a free diver, but I want to be a free diver. And I have, this morning, I was, I was on Instagram, and I saw this, this, ad whatever they have these these ads about learning how to breathe and breathing long enough to be a free diver believe it or not this morning i was thinking about it and i can hold my breath for a certain amount of time in that video they had the oxygen next to me and so when i couldn't hold my breath any longer i did get a little bit of oxygen um so that was cheating but um but it did save me. Uh, and I could stay down longer, but um, I am in awe of free divers. Um, I know Paul Nicklin and Christina Mittermeier, whom I represent. There are two National Geographic photographers, and they've taken so many incredible photographs underwater, yeah. free diving. And so they can hold their breath for a couple minutes. I mean, it's it's not easy. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. <laughs> after walking up a single flight of stairs so i can't imagine <laughs> having the lung capacity to paint underwater that's phenomenal um but i am a swimmer and so i do when i'm we you know when i'm doing my my swimming um i will hold my breath as long as i can as i'm doing my strokes in practice so yeah i can go down like almost almost the whole, whole way down the pool holding my breath a couple times yeah <laughs> Um, we had a question from Dahlia Arado. Uh, they say that human beings are wired to think in roughly 100 year time spans, prioritizing our own survival and consumption habits. How can we foster a more empathetic, community centric mindset so that we can overcome the degradation to our planet? I just really, I thought that was just such a beautifully phrased question. Thank you so much, Dahlia. Um, I'll start with you, Janet. Yeah, I, I, it is a beautifully phrased question, and, and I do believe that you know, it's going to start with the children in school. You need to have programs that will help enlighten them regarding their responsibilities and what life will have to offer if they don't make changes and clean up our mess because, you know, in my age group, it, it's going to be a longer term than I'll be on Earth to finish. So we'll hope that the teachers will inspire and that governments will support and that we will get all of the tools necessary to make the changes that this world needs. And I, 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 I'm in agreement with Janet. I mean, she, she said it. It's our, our generation is the one, is the generation that has compiled a lot of the problems that we have right now. And this is not something that we want to leave to your generation, Jan um, Danny, um, to the millennials. I mean, the millennials have so much to deal with right now um, because of the, the baby boomers and, and uh, the generation before, because we were a generation of, we had everything. We had everything going for us. And there were so many inventions and so many um, wonderful things that our generation created, but we didn't know what the long-term impact of it was going to be. And now it's up to your generation um, to help us along with cleaning up the mess. And like you said, Janet, with 
with education and with the children, um, just with little children, just teaching them how to eat properly and what to use, what not to um, expect, what, what to do. And it's just nothing more than a learning process. I also, if I may say something more, um, I also believe that each person should do more than what is required of them. And so if the law is passed, and I talk about this with the technology for small and moderate businesses around the globe, if a law has been passed and there's a regulation that says you cannot produce this any longer, whatever that may be, that's something even better than that. Take the steps, not what you're made to take. Do more than what you are asked to do, and this world will get a little bit healthier a lot sooner. So I would teach children that too, that they can do more than what's required, and they'll excel. I, I just wanted to add one more thing. Um, when we're talking about um, laws and regulations and big corporations, you know, corporations, quite a few of them are demonized because they've, they've done some bad things as far as. Um, some the way that they're manufacturing and with climate change and say the automobile industry the oil industry but there are companies who are taking that challenge and they're trying to make a difference i know mercedes-benz is um in the next three years and all their european plants are going to be um, going carbon neutral in production and they said by the year 2039 um, they're going to be going carbon neutral in all of their plants and they're going to be producing electric cars more so um, and and I think even in the oil industry there are quite a few people who are in the oil industry in the automobile industry who are seeing the effects and the ravages on the earth and they're trying to make a difference in the way that they're um, producing their products basically so I think what we have to do is we have to partner with these companies, owning companies. I know Rio Tinto, I did a talk for them, and they're talking about sustainable mining, sustainable automobile. Uh, because guess what? As much as we, we demonize, you know, uh, petrol-powered um, cars, who can stop driving? I mean... It's not going to happen. We need transportation and we have to figure out the way. And it's something like you, Dana, who are going to help us along in doing sustainable production of all of the things we need to survive and flourish, not back a hundred years, but go forward. Absolutely. And the United Nations has now the sustainability goals of 2030. And I think it's important for everyone to take a look at those. Every industry is going to have uh, be impacted by them and will have to step up their game. So they're moving that direction, but they'll be required to do more. Um, we had a, a clarifying question that I'm actually happy to tackle um, if you don't mind. Somebody asked um, how race problems affect water quality. Um, I just want to say really quickly for anyone listening who was confused by that question originally, um, you'll find often that people who have safe drinking water are people who live in more well-to-do areas and also uh, are predominantly white. Um, we have to pick, take a serious look at how environmental issues in our country are not dispersed evenly among, across communities. And it is predominantly marginalized communities and communities of color that suffer the effects of pollution in our society. Um, and um, there was also a question about how this conversation pertains to water quality. I was wondering, perhaps, Janet, if you'd want to speak to the connectivity of water on this planet um, and how yes. water anywhere. Um, Absolutely. Impact. Yeah, definitely. So um, I like your clarity on that, number one. I was a little bit thrown by the question to start with, I have to admit, but um, because it's just very painful to know the fact is that you're right. There is definitely... Um, there's just not equality when it comes to what we have available for the health of the world. And so water, just remember, is recycled every day. So with the, the water that you're using in your home is part of the water that has been here from the dinosaurs. And it will continue to be here. The quality, though, uh, will depend upon us. So you have the water that you're using in your home is going to flow into your sewer system or not. 
It's going to be in the ground water, which is affecting our drinking water, which then evaporates into the air, the clouds, the wind, all of it is bringing water in a circle through the rivers and streams, down to you know, the freshwater lakes and onto the ocean. And again, the cycle starts. Uh, so we have to be very careful about water. Every single drop of water is connected to every single water in the world. So it's absolutely a cycle. It is what I call the tapestry of life uh, or an orchestra. When there is one person playing in the orchestra that plays in out of tune or out of sync, it affects the entire piece, just like the world is affected by those of us who don't do good things. It's affecting everyone else. Beautiful. Um, I'm mindful of time. It is a little past three now, and I don't want to keep anyone too late, but I do have one more question that I think would be lovely to end on. I'll, I'll pose it to the group. Um, somebody asked, uh, Janet, you had mentioned specifically your father was an inventor and you grew up around creativity. Um, what would you recommend parents do to encourage that uh, inventor mindset, that creativity in children? What connected it with you as a child and what would you advise parents to do? Yes, I would say um, don't limit a child by saying you can't do that or that's not possible. Because when I hear that, the inside of me boils and I think, oh, really? How can I do that? I want to know give children uh, some choices and then say, and I've only thought of these choices, what else can you think of that might work? Let them use their mind. See, I grew up um, without what I call, um, you know, people say, think outside the box, but I would rather say this, don't have a box, okay? I think that if you tell children there is no box, the world is at your feet, do with it that what you will to make it a better place. They will come up with suggestions, ideas, beyond. And I started inventing when I was very little. I was five or six years old coming up with ideas because my father would say, everything that man has made can be improved upon. If nature made it, leave it alone. Fantastic. This is beautiful. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank everyone again. Um, thank you to our presenters, uh, Erica and Janet, for joining us. I'll leave it. I'll leave it to close it out. Uh, I too want to deeply, deeply thank Eric and Janet. Um, you know, your tireless efforts and your fierce dedication clearly has made a very, very um, strong, beautiful, positive imprint on our planet. And it's um, it's really, really lovely that you've been able to spend your time with us today. So thank you so much for keeping our waters fresh and pure for all of life forms to flourish. And I want to thank each and every one of you for tuning in um, and spending some time with us this afternoon to discuss such a very, very important natural resource, our water, our life form. We invite you to also join us for the rest of the virtual Smith Nature Symposium series including the live stream Smith Nature Symposium Awards Ceremony, Friday, October 2nd, where we will honor Bill McKibben and Sue Halpern, and Donna LaPietra and Bill Curtis will serve as our Master of Ceremonies. All funds um, raised from the symposium, symposium will directly support Thrive Together, Brushwood Center's COVID-19 crisis response for a more just and sustainable future. All presentations will be available in English and Spanish. And to learn more um, about the series, to register and support it with regard to becoming a sponsor, please visit smithnaturesymposium.org. And from all of us at Brushwood Center, from Janet and Erica and Danny, we, we again thank you and wish you well.